morning with the word. We have been in the Holy Spirit filled series. Ben has been discussing aspects of our lives and what it looks like to live filled with the Holy Spirit in each of those. And tonight we're talking about Holy Spirit filled time. Our content, I'd like to read our scripture right off the bat so we're all on the same page. You ready for this? See then that you walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Time is the most valuable commodity that we have. It is our greatest treasure. If you do not believe me, then ask a wife before a husband is to be deployed. Ask her the night before, how valuable is your time? Every minute counts. Ask a parent that just received a terminal diagnosis. Every minute counts. It's precious. There's no dollar amount. There's no health regimen. There's no medical advancements that can add a single moment. There's not an amount of worry that will add a moment beyond our appointed end. Our creator built time with two beautiful aspects. In his infinite wisdom, gave time two characteristics. The first is that there's only a little bit of it. It challenges us to look forward and say, I don't have much. I need to make the most of it. James 4, 13 through 15, he's discussing how it's brazen to take for granted that we have tomorrow. And he concludes his thought with saying, what is your life? You're just a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes, and we're gone. If I was to lay a string of firecrackers, and I promised Ben I wouldn't, from one end of the stage, you know, like those machine gun, all the way across, and I said, do you remember the 37th one? How about the 106th one? You'd be like, no, are you crazy? And yet, that's us on the timeline. And God cares about every one of them. I want to read some quotes from those great 1970s philosophers, Pink Floyd, and their song about time. Let's throw those up there. Taking away the moments that make up a dull day, fritter and waste the hours in an offhand way, You're young and life is long and there's time to kill today. And then one day you find 10 years have got behind you. No one told you when to run. You missed the starting gun. And you run and you run to catch up with the sun, but it's sinking. Racing around to come up behind you again. The sun is the same in a relative way, but you're older. Shorter of breath and one day closer to death. What a secular point of view. the kind of idea that we can waste our time. But isn't that what they're trying to get to, is that eventually we're going to wake up. And we're going to look back on all of our wasted moments, and we're never going to be able to get them back. Jesus in Matthew 6 commanded us to invest our treasure into something lasting, something meaningful, something precious. What is our treasure? Our treasure is our money, our energies, and our time. Time being the chief because we can't get any more of it. God in his wisdom and his grace gave us limited time. And yet we waste so much. We'll spend three hours on a football game but not ten minutes hearing out our spouse when they need us. You know, the average adult spends 354 minutes a day on screen time of some kind. I wonder how many minutes a day we spend in prayer. This recognition forces us to choose our priorities, to make our investment into something eternal. A wise man once said to me, it seems the only thing we can take with us to heaven is our relationships. Our relationship with God and our relationship with others. That's it. 
The second thing about time that God ordained in his wisdom is that every minute has incalculable potential. A lot can happen in the span of a minute. Andre Lobkov can do 107 knuckle push-ups in a minute. Robert Ardito can hit you 805 times. Antonio Domingos can play 824 notes on a piano. Kevin Shelley can break 46 wooden toilet seats over his head. And because this was Jackie's favorite, I'll throw it in. April Choi can remove seven blocks from a Jenga tower with a whip. Whoosh. A lot can happen in a minute. All right, here's the scariest thing I've ever done on stage. You ready? We're going to do audience participation. You can just sit still. We are going to together experience a minute of stillness. Are you ready? Oh. Try me up here. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, go. time. In a single moment, a 30-year mortgage is signed. In just a moment, wedding vows are exchanged. A well-spoken insult can change the direction of a whole life. In just a moment, racism can be modeled or put to death. 60 seconds of indiscretion can destroy a lifetime of testimony, but a lifetime of testimony can bring a multitude to the Father. Here's our thesis statement for this morning. Jesus being the chief cornerstone, our Father is building something in us. If we'll become presence-based sons and daughters, every minute can be another brick that our Holy Spirit Mason can lay in our lives in the lives of those around us and in his kingdom. Imagine the potential when we have 1,440 bricks to offer up to the Lord every day. What could he build in a life? Maybe that's what Jesus meant in Matthew 7 when he talked about, if we'll pay attention and do his words, we'll build our house on the rock. If these two things are true, we have very little time, but every moment has vast potential. And I hope the question that will haunt us this morning is, what am I doing with my time? How am I spending it? Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, see then that you walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Walk carefully, because the days are evil, understanding the will. This is a direct contrast to Paul's chapter 4, verse 17 through 18, where he says, And you should no longer walk as the rest of the unbelievers, Gentiles, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened. There's an understanding that is towards Christ and righteousness, and there is an understanding towards evil and wickedness. Walk carefully. We can't just drift through life anymore. We can't float through hoping that it just sort of works out, right? We have to become people of wisdom and vigilance with our time, looking always to purge our days of anything that is waste. Not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. The phrase redeeming the time is the idea of trying to gain more, of mining it, 
of searching where you can steal just an extra couple minutes towards something of value. I remember when Jackie and I were dating in our first summer, we were working together as counselors at the same summer camp, and we would look for any opportunity to be on the same team, or if she had to run to grab something out of a storage unit, I would try to run and get something out of storage too, right? Because every moment counted. I wanted to steal every minute I could with her. What if we started seeing our relationship with Jesus like that? What if every minute had the potential to be something incredible because the Holy Spirit was filling it? I love what David says in Psalm 90, verse 12. It's, it's not a, a comfortable psalm. He's talking about the wrath of God being poured out against sin. And be, if the wrath of God is, is about to be poured out on sin, then every day that we have is a grace. And he says, So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Gaining a heart of wisdom is cultivated from embracing every day. There's a direct connection between wisdom and how we spend our time. Godly wisdom has a very intentional and poignant attitude towards time. It seeks to purge wasted time and to redeem it. Because every minute has the potential to glorify the Father. Because the days are evil. In the following chapter, Paul is going to talk about how we live in a world full of evil. And it's actually an evil with a consciousness. It's against us. It's fighting us. We don't struggle with flesh and blood. We struggle with principalities, spirits of darkness and wickedness in the heavenly places. We have an adversary. What's the best way for Satan and his imps to defeat us? He doesn't have to defeat us. He just needs to distract us into wasting time. Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What if wisdom was more than just the ability to make good choices? What if we elevated that definition? What if Paul, what if the Holy Spirit through Paul is elevating our definition of wisdom from the ability to make good choices to, what if the definition was understanding the will of the Lord? Because that would apply to everything. How do I have a good marriage? Well, you understand the will of the Lord for your marriage. How do I spend my money wisely? We understand the will of the Lord for our money, right? Is this, is this tracking? Is this getting, is this getting somewhere? Because that is so cool. What if the definition of wisdom is understanding the will of the Lord? This would be beautifully contrasted by Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct. Ooh. Flip through Proverbs. I did it. Flip through Proverbs. Everywhere you see the word wisdom, interject will of the Lord. And it starts getting really interesting. Wisdom isn't meant to be a situationally based tool. Something that we apply here when we need it, but we're good until we get another situation that we need it, right? Because we're supposed to walk carefully, redeeming the time. Wisdom applies to all 1,440 minutes. How do I speak wisely? We understand his will for our words. How do I have wisdom in a struggling friendship? We understand his will for our friendships. How do I have wisdom in family, health, money, sex? We understand the will of God for these. And if this is starting to sound familiar and you want more information, please see the Spirit-Filled series by Ben Bufkin. What is God's will for our most valuable resource? Oh, through the Holy Spirit, I think, I think he wants me to be bold enough to actually propose what his will is for our time. Y'all want to go on this journey with me? No one's going for the doors, okay. Number one, this isn't going to come as a shocker, seek righteousness. Righteousness meaning a right standing with God, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then he'll give us the things that we're needing. We're called to seek a lifestyle where the breadth of our actions motivates who we are to pursue righteousness. 
so that everything that we do or think is holy and glorifying to him. Now, I am, for simplicity and time's sake, I'm going to include love under the category of righteousness because love is one of the things that is God's will for our time, loving God, loving people. But I think it fits cleanly underneath righteousness because if we're going to live in right standing with God, we live in love, right? Also, I think it's very cool that Romans 13, 9 through 10 says that love is the fulfillment of all the law. Number one, seek righteousness. And many, many great men have come before me and many will come after me that will talk about how we seek righteousness in our lives. But I want to move forward to number two. God's will for our time is to seek righteousness. Number two, grow in relationship with the Father. The bulk of what we're going to unpack here comes from A.W. Tozer in his book, The Pursuit of God. It is a good book. It rocked my world. The Pursuit of God, A.W. Tozer. Luke 11, 2, Jesus tells us when we pray, we start off with our Father in heaven. Romans 8, 15, or 8, 15, says that we receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Daddy, Father. John 17, 22 through 23, Jesus is praying and he says that they, talking about us, may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me. The whole bunch of oneness and unity going on here, right? James 4, 8, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. I don't think the image of a father was meant to be an image of disconnection. The image of a father throughout the Bible is meant to under, be understood as intimacy, protection, provision, closeness. He wants us to see him as dad. And God desires this close relationship with us. He reveals himself as a father on purpose. <laughs> and he paid the highest price for our relationship with him. Out of his love for us and his desire for us to know him, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever. Ooh, so good. And so often we confuse salvation as the goal, the end of what God is doing in us. No, but it's not. It's just the beginning. That's the first step out the door. That's the opening of the door. We have a trek ahead of us. If we're just getting hell insurance, we have so much more to understand about God's love. What is the significance of the veil being torn at the victory of Jesus? That we get to live in the very presence. That we can get to go boldly, Hebrews says, into the presence of God, and yet we live with a veil still up in our hearts, don't we? We've said I do to a marriage that we so seldomly visit. But we have a God who said I do too. And he's waiting so often for a relationship that's never going to come. Oh, we keep it on the back burner in case life gets hard. And suddenly when we need a genie, we run to dad. He equipped us for connection. Tozer says that God gave us five senses to experience his creation, but he gave us a sixth sense to experience his presence. Tozer says that for lack of a better word, he's going to call it the spirit, the eyes and the ears of our soul with which we sense our heavenly father. And so often it's like a muscle that's lethargic from unuse, but it can be strengthened into a clear receptor for God's voice and direction. So here's the question. How do we nurture? If, if number one, what was number one? Do y'all remember? Righteous living, right? right? Seek righteousness. Number two, relationship with the Father. So if we're going to pursue waking up the, the dirty antenna in our lives or strengthening this muscle, how do we do it? How do we nurture a spiritual receptivity to hear his voice, to recognize his guidance, to feel his joy towards us, to allow his heart to pour into ours? We begin with God's word. It's pretty simple, right? It's God-breathed. It's everything he wanted us to have. We study his three self-revelations. That's scripture. That's the work of Jesus. That's the person of Jesus. Because there's nothing that he's ever going to say or lead us to that isn't already reflected in God's word. Do we have a lot of voices bouncing around in our heads? I do. How do we begin to know God's voice? We build context by living and breathing his objective word. I mean, how, how can you learn 
counterfeit money unless you learn what the real thing looks like first. And then all the other voices start to sound foreign, right? Number two, this one's fun. We grow in an awareness of his presence. Jesus' last words were, I am with you always to the end of the age. Ha, ah, this blew my mind. Psalm 27.4, remember David? He has this heart to be in God's presence all the time, right? And he says, yeah, I'll quote it for you. So, one thing I desire, one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and behold the beauty of Yahweh. You know what's hilarious? There was no house of the Lord when David was around. God wouldn't let him build it. What's David talking about? He's not talking about a building. He's talking about the very presence of the Most High God, that he would walk in the presence of God every day and behold the beauty of his majesty. Majesty. So often we're like a blind man sitting on the park bench we know that God is omnipresent. We could take a submarine down. We could take a rocket ship out. We're never going to leave the presence of God. But so often we're sitting on a park bench blind and we forget that he's with us. How often do we go throughout our day and we forget he's in the room? We begin with an awareness of his presence. Moment in and moment out. We begin by remembering him and having that awareness in the gaps between our activities, in that breath between one work assignment and the next, in that car ride, in between the conversations, all those little spaces in between our activities, we begin a discipline of remembering God. And then, soon after that, his manifest presence will begin to bleed into our secular jobs, our secular conversations, our secular actions, and they'll become places of spirit-filled work spirit-filled speech and spirit-filled activities. Tozer says there is no difference between secular and sacred because we are sons and daughters of the king. We are high priests through Jesus. So everything that we do, everything that we say becomes sacred for those who walk in the presence of God. So let's begin exercising the spirit of intentionality with our time remembering he's always next to us. He's always with us. And then soon as we go from gaps, that's going to start happening in our activities. Number three, we give time and intentionality to relationship with him. Exodus thirty three eleven. God spoke to Moses as a friend. Remember this? So much is packed into one sentence. Maybe it's one verse. God spoke to Moses like he did his own friend. And when Moses left to return to camp, Joshua stayed behind in the tabernacle. Joshua was not ready to leave the presence of God yet. <laughs> Rushed devotional Sunday mornings, bedtime prayers, and big conferences, and I quote, don't make up for our spiritual bankruptcy. It will take time on our knees and our face, praying, listening, journaling, reading, it takes a pursuit of God to build relationship in the way that I used to pursue Jackie, and I hope that I can get back daily to doing that. We pursue things that we love. We pursue things that we see as valuable. If we'll walk in these three, we will cultivate a presence-based lifestyle where we walk in relationship with Jesus. What is God's will for our time? To seek righteousness, and to grow in relationship with him. Number three, you may not expect this one, unless you read ahead in the notes. Number three, what is God's will for our time? That we will rest well. In Exodus 20, when God gave them commandments, God commands them to take a day off of work. He's like, dudes, work hard, but don't forget to take some time off. And he even promises this in Exodus 20, that if you'll take this day, that it will be blessed by him. Mark 2, 22. I'd love to unpack the context because it's so cool, but we don't have time. They're confronting Jesus. They're trying to catch him in something. And Jesus says, guys, don't you realize the Sabbath was, Sabbath was made as a gift to man. Man wasn't given to the Sabbath. 
God created rest on purpose for us. If there's something that unites us all in here, we all need rest. It isn't a divine recommendation. The creator of our body, our spirit, and our psyche commands rest. So how often do we sleepwalk through our day? Because we're just tired. How often does the time that we have in bed get riddled with just conversations for the next day and stresses of the day before? But this isn't Jesus' intention for our 1,440. Jesus says, come to me, those of you, what? Who are tired, weary, heavy laden. And what's he say? I will give you rest. Don't, wait, wait, wait. I don't want you, I'll miss this. Okay, this is good. An aspect of growing closer to Jesus is that we rest. Wait, I, I think they might have gotten it. Wait, wait, wait. An aspect of growing in our relationship with God is that we rest. Not work harder, not do more stuff, don't put another tick on your to-do list. God is telling us that growing towards Jesus means we rest well. Boy, is that counterproductive to the way we think, right? If we intend to make the most out of every moment of our day, we need to prioritize rest. The people that are the most effective in life rest well. And you know what? Redeeming a time and a place for rest is holy, and God will honor it. Find a place, find a closet, find a stream, find someplace outside, find a hammock, whatever it takes. I'm not just talking about sleep, I'm talking about decompression. God's going to start working on us in our rest. And when you leave that place, you tell it, I'll be back soon. God's will for our time is to rest well. A list of three, righteousness, relationship, rest. I know this list doesn't seem comprehensive, but I'd like to offer to you, I'd like to argue with you, that anything that you would add to this is actually a fruit of it. What about evangelism? Seek first the kingdom, right? What on earth do we have to offer a dying world if we're not already carrying around these three? What do we have to offer a wicked, exhausted, disconnected world if we are not already carrying the treasure of these three principles? Righteousness, relationship, rest. If we'll become presence-based people, people of righteousness, relationship with the Father, and who rest well, every minute can be another brick our Holy Spirit Mason can lay in our lives, in the lives of those around us, and in his kingdom. See then that you walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, it's yours. Lord, I pray you'll create in us a discipline of righteousness, of relationship with you, and of rest. Oh, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for every wasted moment. Forgive us for everything that we've done or that we've left undone, that we've spoken or that we've failed to speak that didn't bring glory to you. Lord, I pray that our time becomes an altar and that we'll stop sacrificing things on that altar that don't give you glory. Lord, I pray that we'll climb up on that altar and we'll give you all of us. What else do we have but our time? Lord, creating us a clean heart. Purge from us our habits of waste. And let us love well. Let us live well. Fill with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.